So to start, can you say and spell your name? Sure. Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, Minuti, M-I-N-I-U-T-T-I. Awesome. Well, today is Thursday, July 26th. We are at Bombshell Brewing in uh, Holly Springs, North Carolina, and um, we are doing an interview for the Well-Crafted NC Project. So Michelle, first, can we start by having you just tell us about your background? Where are you from and how did you get here? Absolutely. So I grew up in Maine and um, Maine had kind of an earlier craft beer scene than a lot of other states in the country. So I started getting exposed to craft beer shortly after I turned uh, 21 in the late, 90, uh, late 80s and uh, the early 90s. And uh, lived in Maine until the time I was 30, moved down to Georgia, got relocated with a former corporate job here to the Raleigh-Durham area, and uh, met one of my business partners, Ellen Joyner. And um, I, we, but we both worked in corporate America, and we became golf buddies. And that's kind of how Bombshell got started was when we couldn't golf on the weekends when it was raining we would go out to local bars restaurants craft breweries and drink craft beer and you know have a good time and one day we had gone out and you know we were just talking about wow you know there's not many women in the craft brewing industry and we had also been discussing for a long time about what are the opportunities to get out of corporate America and start an entrepreneurial venture? And it dawned on us at that point that, well, why don't we look into starting our own craft brewery? And Ellen had actually been a home brewer as well for about 10 years um, during that time, you know, prior to us coming up with the concept of, of starting a brewery. So, you know, it was kind of a really good mesh between, you know, we knew craft beer. She'd been a brewer for quite some time, and we were looking for you know, a nice entrepreneurial opportunity. And I think one of the strongest things was there's no women, or very few women, um, in the craft brewing industry, and we wanted to change that. So that was one of the kind of the founding reasons that we started Bombshell. Yeah, so when did, when did you move to, this, to the Raleigh-Durham area? Uh, 2003. Okay. Um, there, there wasn't an awful lot going on in the craft beer scene at that point no. in, in North Carolina, was there? <laughs> no. Um, see, uh, Carolina Brewing was actually in Holly Springs. They started brewing in 1997, but there was a law that uh, you couldn't have beer over, I believe it was 5.5 or 5%, and uh, there were a number of people that were instrumental in getting that law changed. And once the pop the cap law was uh, repealed, uh, that's when the microbrewing industry really kind of took off in, in North Carolina. Yeah, so when would you say um, kind of the seeds for Bombshell first popped up? Uh, 2010 um, was really, you know, Ellen and I, as I mentioned, we had been golfing together and we were really enjoying a lot of the craft beer that was in, emerging at that time. Um, but that's when we floated the concept of, hey, let's, let's look at starting our own microbrewery, and we did a lot of investigative work around it. And I think one of the things that was the most shocking to us as we explored um, getting, you know, trying to start the craft brewing, um, our craft brewery, was that very, very few women actually owned a craft brewery. And we were only able to determine that there were, at the time, four craft breweries in the country that were 100% women owned. And, you know, Bombshell to this day is still 100% women owned. It's myself, Ellen, my business partner, and Jackie. Um, we don't have any outside investors, and that's a, that's a blessing and a curse at the same time, and we can talk about that um, further down the line. But um, we're still North Carolina's only 100% women owned microbrewery. There are some that are majority owned, but not 100%. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about kind of the process that went into opening Bombshell. You said 2010 was about the time when the seeds first started getting planted, but um, let's talk about the process from we have an idea to we've opened the doors to the brewery. That's, it, it was a journey. It, it certainly was a journey. Um, the first year that 
after we kind of coined, let's, let's go out and open our own craft brewery, uh, we did a lot of brewing. Um, my house became the brewery. And uh, we had a three vessel brew sculpture. And it's funny, in hindsight, a lot of my neighbors said, oh, we drove by and we wondered what the heck you guys were doing. Um, because we'd be out there, you know, sometimes as soon as we could after work and brewing until 11 o'clock at night or, you know, on the weekends, always brewing. And one of the things that we wanted to do is really kind of go out there and test just people's palates. Um, we would take a lot of our beer and kind of do blind taste testing at parties or, you know, different events that we would go to. We'd bring growlers and we'd label them A, B, C, D. And sometimes what we would do is we would take beer from other breweries and we would have people rate things because we wanted to see like how, how are we doing? And um, you know, a lot of times we'd have 40, 50 surveys and we had a pale ale recipe that we would kind of benchmark or um, put up against a lot of the other benchmark pale ales in the industry. And we got very favorable results. A lot of times we would win, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was kind of the first year, um, along with trying to source our equipment, um, find a location. And you know, that was an, that's another thing, why Holly Springs? Um, both Ellen, myself, well, all of us, Ellen and I and Jackie all live in Holly Springs. And you know, we were very tied to the community. We love this community. And we really wanted to be able to open the brewery here in Holly Springs. It wasn't, it wasn't a deal breaker, but it was definitely a preference. So we started working, um, you know, during that initial year of concept development, on trying to find a location in Holly Springs. And we came across this building and signed a lease. And then for the next nine months after that, we worked on building out the brewery. And I think that's one of the things that really differs uh, now is it's, it's a lot easier to build out a brewery. And I, you know, one of the things that kind of held us up was our process piping that we have. We have a steam-fired uh, uh, steam kettle and we had to have a low pressure boiler installed. And we had a real difficult time getting that uh, bid in place. We had budgeted uh, $18,000 for the installation of our process piping because we felt since our boiler cost $26,000, $18,000 should be sufficient. Well, the first estimate that we got was $15,000, so we were really excited because it was well under $18,000. But the second estimate that we got was $60,000. <laughs> like, what's going on? Then we get one that's $30,000. Then we get one that's $45,000. So, we had to go back and forth um, over the course of several months because there weren't a lot of tradesmen in this area that actually had experience installing these low pressure steam boilers. And you know, they're, it, they can be dangerous. Um, so that was one of the things when we were building out that's really frustrating. And what's changed about that now is that with the advent of so many breweries being built in the area, that skilled tradesman set, whether it's installing glycol lines or your um, boiler um, or any, a lot, you know, trench drains, any of that, there's really kind of a, a local go-to market for that that really helps, I think, speed up the process for anybody that's looking, out, looking at building out their brewery right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the other um, one of the other things that's popped up in some of the interviews we've done in terms of kind of asking folks about their opening is issues with uh, permitting. And did you run? Did you guys run into anything? So that's a great question. Actually, not really. The only thing that we ran into that was um, different, like a lot of people ask, why do you have you know a wall that separates the tap room from the brewery? That was a code, uh, city of uh, Holly Springs mandated code. So they consider that manufacturing environment. And you, it, you have to have a one hour firewall. And if you go into the brewery, you'll see it says one hour firewall um, that separates the tap room, the retail space from the manufacturing environment. So we would have loved to have left it open. It really would have created a nice atmosphere, um, but it wasn't something that was feasible according to co code. The second thing that we ran into was um, the town really not understanding the mill. 
we built a mill room that has exhaust fan, but when the fire chief came, he was looking at it and saying, well, these walls aren't fireproof. And um, it was going to potentially be this whole you know, aspect of ha having to dismantle that. And we had to convince him that you know, we weren't milling down to a fine powder that can cause you know, spontaneous combustion and um, you know, through electrical spark generation and what have you. So those were two things that were kind of you know, a pain. Um, but the boiler was the thing that slowed down the build out process the most because it was a lot of money. Um, it was something that came in way over budget. <laughs> we ended up spending about $30,000 um, on the process piping. And uh, so anyway, th that whole build out, like it occurred, we started on, in January of 2013. And then we did our first brew in November of 2013, sold our first keg, the lap, last part of November and then the tap room opened up in January of 2014 so we're oh, wow. we're, we're kind of encroaching um, on our five-year anniversary of operations um, as an we are an LLC and we actually formed our LLC officially in September of 2012 very cool so I'm gonna back up a minute because you were talking about kind of before you actually opened you uh, started brewing out of the garage <laughs> um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that and how how did you how did you learn the home brewing skill and how how did it kind of transfer into operating a brewery so that's a that's a great question and um, so Ellen you know had a lot of recipes and sometimes we would kind of go back and redo those recipes um, we also hired our first brewmaster about I think we brought him on eight months before we actually opened and at the time he was living in Pittsburgh um, and we would fly him back for brew days back and forth from Pittsburgh to Raleigh is pretty economical on I think it was Southwest or we'd get you know pretty cheap plane tickets and we'd all do you know brew weekends where we'd be brewing you know I had five chest freezers in my um, in my bonus room so you know we would be brewing somewheres in the area of we do about six one barrel uh, batches over the weekend I mean it was just constant um, so you know that's part of you know what we would do from a brewing standpoint and you know different recipes we would tinker with um, different yeast you know in the same same wort um, but unfortunately, one of the things now that I own the brewery is I don't get to brew very often anymore because I'm, um, I take care of sales, our outside sales team. I do a lot of the marketing, um, the advertising. So a lot of my responsibilities within the world of running this business take me away from brewing. And, um, it's kind of un it's kind of it's not it's unfortunate because I love to brew, but we have an awesome head brewer Devin Singley is our head brewer here, and um, he does a great job. Um, Ellen does more of the the brewing operations. Although Ellen and I did brew a special beer for um, the Pink Boot Society um, International Women's Brew Day back in March, that we we called it Pinky Brewster, and. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was a, it was a pale ale, and um, it used a special blend of hops that um, some of the ladies from the National Pink Boot Society developed with um, YCH Hop Farms, and it was really tasty. We got really great reviews on it, and um, we, in, in terms of giving back, um, what we've done is we were almost through. Well, we're almost through. We're through the batch, but we're going to give five bucks for every keg of beer that we sold back a house to the Pink Boot Society for their scholarship program. Very cool. So during those early years, the early processes, are there particular resources that you leaned on to kind of grow as a brewer or even learn about the industry a bit more? So in terms of that, you know, going to some of the brew conferences, reading books, pro brewer, 
uh, new brewer, you know, just talking to other brewers about, you know, what they're doing from a recipe and a strategic marketing direction. Um, we have a really wonderful guild here um, in North Carolina, and that's, I think, really helped to help us develop our business as well as many of the other breweries that are here in North Carolina. And you know, also leaning on my professional corporate background, which was in sales and marketing. Um, and to, uh, way back before I got into sales and marketing, I was also in finance. So I do a lot of the long-term capital um, strategy planning. You know, what's, what's our business structure gonna be? What's our finance structure going to be? Those are things that I focus on for the business. So, you know, relying on that professional background to do a lot of the day in and day out operations as well as a lot of the strategic planning. Yeah. And there's never enough hours in the day. <laughs> of course not. Ever. <laughs> well, and you know, I think, I, I think that kind of that transferable skill piece is an important piece to think about um, when going from one industry to another. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of corporate world versus the brewery world and I'm assuming there there's lots of similarities but also lots of differences there are you know I think one of the things um, you know I was at a director level in corporate America so I was at you know a pretty good level but I still kind of was an armchair quarterback like oh if I own this company <laughs> I might do it this way and um, I worked, the last company that I worked for was Siemens Healthcare. So, you know, Siemens as an organization is actually a global top 40 company. So, you know, a, an organization that is, you know, just pro very process oriented, uh, very accounting centric. Um, that's how they make their decisions. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, Ellen and I, talked about, you know, as we were starting the businesses, we're going to do things this way. And sometimes we've been able to do that, but not always, you know, when the rubber hits the road, sometimes, you know, it's a different story. And, and it's, you know, constant adaptation and adjustment and, you know, being nimble because the marketplace changes so quickly. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Can you think of an example of kind of where you were heading in one direction and you had to make that switch? So I think when we started looking at packaging our beer into, you know, what what package orienti uh, orientation were you going to go to? So um, about seven years ago, bombers were kind of the thing to do, and that really dissipated pretty quickly. And, you know, very few places really want that, that format. And our capacity prior to that wasn't such that we could really go into alternate packaging uh, forms. So we didn't do any bombers and um, we kind of made a conscious decision that, you know, what it's, it's changing, where's it going? So we evolved into canning and we've been using mobile canning now for approximately two years. We actually have a canning line on order. Um, we have a, a Twin Monkeys canning line that will be coming um, early to mid-September, at least that's the date they're telling us. And, um, you know, we're excited about that. But um, that's gonna allow us to do a lot of different things that we haven't been able to do. But going back to canning, um, when we were first starting at it, you know, you can go the route of painted cans, but you have to have a certain volume to do that. The other thing that a lot of people do are shrink wraps on their cans and we chose to go uh, after doing a lot of um, market research and testing um, market audiences we decided to go with an adhesive label and one of the reasons we chose that was it allows us to be really nimble and quick because the we can do a graphic design on it you know we can get with our graphic designer he can push through a, you know a, a design in maybe a week or two and then right when we get that we can send it to our printer and then in a week we can have a label so the lead time is really short which is important if you're kind of doing like a specialty batch and you just want you you know it might be a one and done and you don't ha you can't really do that with shrink wraps um, it's just it's not an easy process and it's about a six to eight week lead time um, to even get it into production 
So by the time you get it, your beer is basically already moved through your brewery. Or you have to have foresight, you know, way ahead of time. And one of the challenges is, is that you have to have, you know, approval of your label with your, a your ABV on it. So there's a lot of things that are very challenging. And we feel that, you know, going to the adhesive label was something that necessarily we didn't want to do at first because we really liked the look of shrink wrap cans. Um, but we found it was definitely better for the brewery from a logistics standpoint. And when we did test market um, our various audiences, it wasn't something that was material to them as to whether or not on the shoulder of the can you could see the, you know, the aluminum versus having the wrap that goes all the way to where the lid has been uh, placed and sealed on the can. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the can and logos, can you talk a little bit about kind of how you guys decided on the name, but also the logo. Okay, I, I would love to. Um, our logo is sometimes a point of controversy with people. And some people feel that it sexually objectifies women. And we never intended it to be in that way. And I think in this day and age, sometimes when you know, your intentions don't always match how people interpret things. So first off, I'll start, I'll come back to that, but I'll start with um, Bombshell as a name. So as I mentioned, Elle and I were golfers, and um, when we were younger and perhaps a bit slimmer, um, <laughs> after we, we'd get done golfing, you know, the, the group of people that would be hanging out at, at, the, at the golf course would say, oh, here come the blonde bombshells. So as we kind of, you know, search for, you know, we've got this craft brewery, what are we going to name it? Are we going to name it, you know, Holly Springs Brewery? Are we going to, you know, some of the more clever names? Um, we were like, some, somehow the bombshell floated to the top because we, you know, we are 100% women owned. And um, there are several definitions to bombshell. And one of those definitions is it's an unexpected surprise. And that was the definition that we hung on to as far as bombshell, because we were, hey, look, we're you know, a group of women that are opening our own microbrewery, and there's not very many uh, women involved in the craft brewing industry. Hey, isn't that an, a wonderful surprise? So that's the, that's the definition that we clung, uh, clung to as far as bombshell was concerned. Um, our logo, we worked with a designer um, out of South Carolina. Um, it's a logo that tested really well among both males and females. And um, we didn't want, we, we wanted something that was, you know, female centric as far as our logo, but we didn't necessarily want it to embrace white or, you know, some person um, in general. And that's why we chose the silhouette because who is it? Is it? Who, what race is that? It's not important for us. You know, one of the things that we also set out as part of our mission was to make sure that we were producing beers that would get people to drink craft beer. So, you know, more easy drinking um, styles that, you know, a lot of times people, you know, not so much now because most people have in fact had craft beer, but when we were getting started, there were still a lot of people that were craft naive. And a lot of times what happened when you, you might go out and somebody, you would say, well, what are you drinking? And you're like, oh, I'm drinking craft beer. Oh, let me taste it. Well, it happened to be an IPA. And if you don't drink, you know, hoppy IPAs, the first sip of an IPA might be a bit bold for you. So we, you know, we really said we want to, you know, make sure that we, in our beer portfolio, that we have styles that, you know, can appeal to a wide range of drinkers, whether you have, you know, you're a hoppy IPA lover or you're somebody that's new. We want to make something that can have you or allow you to enjoy something that's been locally produced that, you know, is crafty and, um, you know, that, that mannerism. Um, the other thing about um, the logo is, um, you know, we wanted it to stand for female empowerment. And that's what that motion is about. It's like, hey, I'm doing this. I, I've got it nailed. I'm going out, and no one's stopping me. So that's the other part of you know our our logo personification. Um, it is disappointing. I you know it, it. She is very shapely, and I think one of the the funny stories um, about the logo is Ellen um, went out to eat, and she went to a restaurant and they were bringing out the birthday cake and the chef 
decided that he was going to make the logo out of chocolate sauce. <laughs> and so in the kitchen, he did it. And by the time it got to the table, the logo had spread. And we were like, yeah, it looks just like us now. <laughs> So, and that's kind of a funny thing is, you know, people always ask, oh, who, po who posed for it? Uh, n none of us posed for it. But um, it's, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that was me in an earlier day, I wish. So, you know, it's, it, and I think that's the other part of it is, you know, it's being fun, you know, and I think, you know, are we, the society, I think, is really moving, you know, if you don't agree with what I agree with, then you're wrong, you know? And it, it, are we really moving towards more tolerance? And, or, you know, is it, you, your opinion is different than mine. And, um, you know, help me to understand why your opinion is different. And, you know, okay, I, I might not agree with that, but thank you for sharing it. And I can respect that, so, yeah. yeah. So you touched on this, uh, but can you talk a little bit about how you would define the main mission for Bombshell. So our main mission, you know, is to produce easy drinking, well-crafted beers, you know, at a very high level. We want people to, you know, when they see our tap handle or they see our product, you know, in the store, we we want them to know, oh, they make they make good to great beer. And um, you know, we that's our first goal. And um, you know, the second thing is I really want to have a, an, an environment for my employees where we have a great family, we work together to achieve higher objectives. And then the third thing that I think the company really centers on is being a good community steward. We do a lot of um, fundraising activities. We um, focus on both the first Friday and the third Friday of each month. We give 10% of profits back to a charitable um, entity or a philanthropic focus um, that's localized in our community. And um, it's a win-win. It gives that organization um, exposure and, um, you know, to what their cause is. And, you know, it helps us. It brings in oftentimes new customers that may not have been here before. Um, you know, we had one event last year that raised more than $8,000. Um, and we wrote a pretty nice check to them for the days, um, you know, 10% of profits. So, you know, it, that's something that's really, um, for me, you know, at the end of the day, after all the hard work, you know, when, when my head hits the pillow, I, I think I feel really great about being involved in the community like that. You know, just yesterday, um, I gave my favorite brew tour ever, and I've been doing brew tours now for five years. Um, I had a group of young, um, inspiring adults from Gigi's Playhouse, which is um, an organization in Raleigh that works with uh, Down syndrome um, people. And um, they came over, they were primarily like 18 to 21 years of age. And we did a brew tour and we had lunch and, you know, they were, they asked great questions. We had tons of fun. Um, it's part of what they call Exploration Week. And you know, I felt really honored and privileged that they chose you know a brewery, and they chose our brewery to to come and um, you know partake in that. So those are the types of things that was you know I made you know eight new friends yesterday, and um, you know it's just it was really rewarding. So I, I like those aspects. Or you know you're out someplace and somebody says, oh bombshell, oh, I've had your beer, I love your beer, and I've heard about some of the things that you do in, you know, for the community, and those are all just really cool and very rewarding, and, you know, as we become, you know, a bigger and better brewery, those are things that, you know, I and my business partners want to expand on. Yeah, um, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. <laughs> we'll put a pin in that for now all and right. come back to it. Um, can you talk a little bit about both the size of the brewery now, the production and mm -hmm. everything, but also kind of where you were when you first opened okay. versus where you are now. So um, when we first opened our first year, we did, our, I think, just under 800 barrels. Last year, we did right around 1,800 barrels, and we're on target this year to do someplace around 19. We just added some more capacity. Um, and we're going to be hopefully getting into some new markets um, in the fall um, that will help to open up volume yeah. for us. And can you talk about the markets that you're in right now? So we are a self-distributing brewery. 
so we've tried to you know focus primarily on on growing our business in the, the greater triangle area but we also go out to Greensboro and uh, Winston-Salem and basically through the the 40 corridor um, just you know from logistics and um, you know aspects of our drivers still being in within OSHA compliance and and what have you but now adding some more capacity we're actually talking um, to potentially some distributors about bringing our beer into different areas we have a lot of people that come here to the brewery to pick up beer and bring it to you know their bottle shop um, and we've had a lot of requests um, I think the, the coolest one was we got a request from a theater in New York City that was um, they had a play that was like bombshells on fire and <laughs> they wanted our beer uh, in New York City to you know market with their play and we only distribute in the state right now so that wasn't an option but it was a pretty cool request that is a pretty cool <laughs> request um so you know the triangle brewing scene has changed dramatically yes since you first opened can you talk a little bit about like what it looked like then and how it looks now yeah so i think when we were starting the, there were um 11 um, microbreweries in Wake County and I think we're embarking upon 49 so you know th that's a lot but I think the thing to keep in context is the model that each of those breweries employs um, not all of those breweries are distribution breweries you know a lot of them focus on just on-premise as um, you know their their pathway and um, so you know that's definitely um, you know, there is obviously increased cooperation, as we call it in North Carolina. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you just have to keep making, you know, great beer and, you know, have, have the beer speak for itself and have great representation out on the streets to let everybody know about, you know, what you're doing and what's new at Bombshell and, you know, winning a few medals here and there. We're hoping for a big one. We've won a lot of the, uh, we've won a number of medals in the state brewers uh, competition. And um, we won a few at the Beer Army competition, which is actually, that's an international competition. Um, and we received word with the World Beer Cup Awards that just came back. Um, one of our beers made it to medal, the medal, evalu um, medal evaluation round. So, you know, sometimes competitions are kind of luck of the draw and, you know, they're becoming, there's more and more entries. So, you know, I don't want to say it's just roll of the dice. It's not just that, but there is some element of, you know, being in the right place at the right time um, with those. But, you know, that's, it's always a, a, a great plus. You know, Linwood Brewing is just, they've won, you know, a bunch of medals in both uh, World Beer Cup and G GABF. And I think in the triangle, they're, They've, they've got kind of the, and Lone Rider also has, but I think they have the most medals in some of the big competitions, so kudos to Bill and Ted and their crew over at Linwood. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the beer. Uh, what do you consider, do you ha or do you have a beer that you consider to be your flagship beer? So our biggest seller is our Head Over Hops IPA. Um, and you know, probably most of the breweries that you talk to, the IP and IPA is kind of going to be their beer centric. Um, you know, statistically, IPA sales, you know, in in the pie represent about sixty percent of overall beer sales. So it's just logical that you know, IPA is probably one of your your best sellers. So um, we have another beer that sells very well for us. It's a seasonal called Strawberries and Cream, um, and that is a beer that. So a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with, um, you know, a hop head like myself, not their favorite beer. Uh, people that are not, you know, new to craft or love that beer. And it's, you know, it's refreshing. It's a great poolside or beachside beer, um, but it's not necessarily my go-to beer. <laughs> but people love it. So, um, yeah. yeah. And do you have any of the beers? still today that are legacies from when you guys were first? We actually have one um, in its namesake only. So our Dirty Secret Coconut Stout was a beer that we had um, that we brewed the first year that we were open. We brewed it in 2014. 
um, and that beer is still currently in seasonal production. Um, we've changed the recipe a lot. Um, we do, um, you know, all natural um, coconut. It's not like an extract or anything of that nature. Um, but we've changed the way that we infuse the, the actual flaked and shredded coconut um, into the brewing process to kind of bring more flavor out. And I think that's, that's one thing is just, you know, one of the big trends, there's a trend for pilsners and lagers right now, you know, crisp beer that is technically very difficult to brew because there's not like a bunch of hops, you know, hiding behind or hops to hide behind. Um, but then also just other beers just more flavor oriented with them. Like we just did a variant that I'm drinking right now, which is our Citra Pale Ale, and we did it with you know mango infusion, and um, we used some mango puree, and then we also peeled and chopped up dozens and dozens of mangoes. <laughs> so um, yeah, <laughs> but it's it's very tasty. It's a lot of work, but yeah. sometimes you know <laughs> it pays off in the end. Um, can you talk a little bit about a typical day or week here at the brewery? So, there, a typical day is more atypical than typical. Um, you know, some, sometimes, you know, I'm up at 4 o'clock doing emails. Sometimes I might not get up as soon, but for me, um, you know, I, I'm getting up, I'm looking at, you know, what's come in, you know, overnight looking at sales results, maybe getting um, sales data out to my team, looking at trends, you know, inventories, thinking strategically. I like to do a lot of that stuff in the morning. My head's a lot clearer. That's after a couple cups of coffee to get me started. But um, it's also more, it's, you know, it's less interrupted than any other point in time during the day before the phone starts ringing, um, you know, or questions start happening. So, you know, in a, as a, you know, in a small business, you really work, you know, as a team. So there's lots going on. Um, you know, Mondays is our production meeting. We have a production meeting every Monday. We look at what's happened the past week and then, you know, do our forecasting um, and our planning for, you know, what, you know, new things look like. Right now, we're actually starting to plan for, you know, January. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long process, um, forward-looking process. Uh, you know, sometimes the days don't end until midnight. You know, if we have an event going on, you know, outside or um, whether it's a festival, you know, by the time you're, you're packing it up and bringing it back to the brewery and cleaning it all up, um, you know, at this point in time, we're still doing a lot of those tasks. So it's, you know, jack of all trades, do what you need to do. Oh, we ha we're having an event and, you know, the bathroom isn't working properly. All right, put your plumber hat on and walk in there and get that fixed. So, you know, you're constantly changing those hats um, through, you know, through the course of the day. And some days, not a lot's going on. So, you know, that's good. Then other days, like, everything's breaking loose. We had a bit of a plumbing incident. <laughs> Um, two weeks ago when we were installing a new tank, a fitting came off that wasn't supposed to came off and an entire batch of head over hops proceeded to spew across the, um, the brewery. And that's why you have good insurance. <laughs> but, um, you know, then we have to go about how do we manage inventory because we have customers that, you know, are going to be, they have that on tap on a regular basis. And you know how do we work through that supply? You know that supply challenge. So you take you know immediate measures, and you know no new accounts can have this beer, and you know you're shuffling things all around. So that's pretty typical. Is just so, you know solving what are today's challenges, and you know having fun. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your team too. Can you talk a little bit about how many folks you guys have? So sure. So we have 13 employees right now. Um, or 13 positions. We have a we have a vacancy right now um, in the triad in our sales um, capacity. Uh, we have seven full-time employees. No, five full-time employees. So plus owners. So you know that's interesting. Seeing that it went from we had um, some wait staff that worked here in the tap room. We had three people that were on a part-time basis when we first opened, and a head brewer. You know, and now we've grown. 
substantially. And you know, the goal we're actually looking, we've been trying to fill our assistant brewer role and find the right match for that. Um, and you know, it was it was interesting because I had a great conversation with Oscar Wong. I think it was the first six months that we were open, and he always he said, "Hire slow and fire fast." <laughs> so make sure you know everybody's the right fit. Now, did I always heed his, his, have I heeded his advice always? No, and unfortunately, I suffered some of the consequences. So um, we're actually you know we're actually going going slow and, and making sure we have the right fit. Yeah. So um, you've touched on a number of these already, but what were some of the biggest challenges that came through kind of after you had opened the development of the brewery to this, you know, you've talked about the growth, but I'm, I'm assuming that it was not all smooth sailing. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, in any business, cash flow can be, you know, a challenge. We, we take, you know, we take raw materials and we turn them into you know, into beer, and then you know how converting your assets into cash to go back and pay the bills. Well, you know the most terms are 30 days, so you know my bills are going to be due before I've sold my beer. <laughs> so you know that's always kind of you know a challenge. And as I alluded to, um, we are we're a bootstrap company. Me, Jackie, and Ellen are the people that funded this business. We don't have any outside investors. So, you know, we are very proud of the fact that our people have always been paid on the day that they, you know, we've, in the past five years that we've been in business, payroll has always happened. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that maybe sometimes can be challenging is just managing the finances. But this year has been, you know, a really great year for us. And the other thing that, that makes that difficult is you're always looking at reinvesting in the business. And we've funded a lot of our capital, our capital expenditures through operating cash. Um, you know, oh, we need to buy a new fermenter. Okay, well, we're going to write a check out of, you know, our operating cash because we're, you know, we're not going to the bank to get another loan. So just balancing a lot of those financial aspects, you know, can be challenging in that, in that regard. Um, you know, the other thing too is somebody calls in sick. <laughs> now what, right? We have, we have delivery drivers and we have awesome, awesome delivery drivers. You know, and it's so critical that they're, you know, dependable, not like, oh, I have a hangnail and I can't come into work today. Um, because if they don't go and do deliveries, guess who puts the delivery hat on for that day? Me. And, you know, one of the other things that's challenging in any brewery is lifting half barrels, right? I mean, if you talk to most of the brewers, they all, everybody has bad backs because they do things that they shouldn't, which is lift half barrels by yourself. Um, six still is no problem, but you know, getting a half barrel in and out of a delivery van as a female um, is, is a challenge. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the same problem in our archives with people lifting really heavy boxes off the <laughs> Exactly. Um, so to go back to, to what you had mentioned a minute ago uh, that we put a pin in, talk community engagement and, and that work. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, some of the specific, particularly the Fridays, the first and third Friday events that you guys do and how that came to be? So, you know, again, we, we had done periodic like, oh, here's a, you know, a, an event that we're going to do. You get every day we probably get at least you know three to four requests for some type of charitable contribution and you know we'd be out of business if we donated to every single one of them even if it's just like you know a growler fill and a t-shirt and I mean we're we're inundated with requests and although we'd love to you know as I said support everybody we have to make some choices so you know we just said you know how are we going to respond to you know people what's what's going to be our, our you know kind of our policy and that's where we decided well let's have it focused on you know a fright a friday um but what's happened now is that you know with doing them once a, a month those fridays are all booked up for like the next year and then we have people lined up for next year so then we said well let's look at adding a second uh date to that and um those are pretty full right now too so <laughs> yeah. that's kind of how we you know we focused on that but we do I mean we ought, we do lots of like you know get a free growler fill bring the certificate in um, 
you know, people are having their silent auction. They want like a little prize pack, and you know, Jackie evaluates most of those and decides, you know, what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, so, looking back at kind of your hopes and dreams when you guys first opened versus today, are there big surprises that kind of stand out to you? Um, anything you just really didn't anticipate? Um, I had a pretty realistic outlook, um, you know, on things. I think perhaps you know, the, the actual number of hours that it takes to run a business. And, you know, oftentimes when I've done brew tours, you know, people ask me, like, how does this job differ than your corporate job? And, you know, I say, well, I'm working more hours, but the difference is I get to pick my hours a lot more. So, you know, I work mostly all the days that end in Y. <laughs> yes, seven days. But also, you know, it might be I, I escape for five hours and I don't have inherently, you know, accountability to, to someone to say, no, you, you know, you can't go there because you need to, you know, be available or something of that nature. So there's, there's some flexibility there um, yeah. with the number of hours that, you know, that you're working. Yeah. So looking forward, what plans, what hopes and dreams do you have for Bombshell going forward? So we are in the middle right now of um, strategic evaluation of um, expansion, primarily for our tap room. And you know, Holly Springs is a growing community and um, we get asked at least three to four or five times a week for private event space. And we can't fulfill that. Uh, we used to occasionally have the brewery as, you know, a place that people could have their events. And we can still do it, but we just added several new tanks. Um, we've, we've taken more cooperage as our business has, you know, bought more cooperage. And we just don't have, you know, floor space and the disruption to the production process to host events. So um, we're looking for, you know, what's next in terms of the tap room, um, whether, you know, we go to uh, another building and set up a small production facility that might be focused on sours um, in that location and then turn this all, this whole, f and barrels in that, that secondary location and focus um, just on uh, production here in this building or Maybe we go and take production, you know, the large scale production someplace else where we're looking at the most cost effective, um, you know, space per square foot for, for production. Yeah. But there's a lot of money in moving, you know, money and disruption in moving your existing production facility. And some breweries have done that and it's been very detrimental to their financial well being long term because there's always something that comes up and doesn't go as smoothly as you've planned and that can be you know something that's very difficult to recover from right um well you've mentioned that um you know bombshell is 100 percent woman owned and craft brewing is definitely an industry that today is still kind of stereotypically thought of as a male industry <laughs> um do you feel that there are challenges that you guys have, have faced in opening and operating your own? Uh, not from, not from a, like a, you know, discrimination standpoint. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think that's played into it at all. I think probably one of the biggest challenges that we've had as a, a smaller self-distributing brewery is um, fighting against the big distributorships. You know, um, I think that's one of the, the, the big things is just, you know, that whole concept of pay to play and um, industry practices that, you know, by ABC and law are actually prohibited but are done. Um, and, you know, I think that's probably one of the, the, the biggest challenges when, you know, you go into a bar or restaurant and, and this doesn't happen very often, but it's, it's kind of, a real stinker when it does and they're like well no you know this distributing company owns these taps and they own these taps and you can kind of size it up when you walk in there as to whether or not they work with self-distributing breweries um, but you know at any rate that's I think that's probably one of the things that if I could say if there's one thing that you could change 
for craft brewing in North Carolina would really be just the, the, the you know, the, I guess, you know, the, I don't, I'm, I don't necessarily, the bully, the, you know, the big bully, because not all distributors are like that. We're actually looking at them, so it's not necessarily fair to put them all in that, in that box, but, um, you know, I just think that everybody being playing nice in the sandbox would be, would be good. Yeah. Um, and kind of, you know, I think not facing discrimination is one thing, but are there particular benefits? Things that you think <laughs> as three women going into an industry where there aren't a lot of women, like any particular backgrounds or mindsets that you guys brought that you think kind of maybe even gave you a leg up and let you, you know, helped you in growing to where well, you are. And I think it goes back to capturing, a, you know, a wide demographic, you yeah. know, it's just not, hey bro, let's drink some beer, you know, um, and, it, you know, women, you know, more women beer drinkers or, you know, people of, you know, ethnicity, um, you know, I think that helped, you know, we have worked in, you know, corporate America where we've had a lot of training around inclusiveness and I think we, you know, we can bring that, you know, to the table. So, mm -hmm. you know, having diversity, you know, among a lot of different, you know, aspects, well, you know, sexual orientation, race, you know, I just, you know, I think that's, that's important for me is that, you know, people recognize Bombshell as somebody that embraces, you know, everyone. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give if you, if a woman came up and was like, I want to open my own brewery? <laughs> what have, advice would you have, give her? Have a business plan and really understand what you're getting yourself into, um, is very, very important. Um, you know, because y you, one of the things that, you know, I would say, what, what, what's something else that's really changed from the time that, you know, before you decided, before you opened up the brewery is, unfortunately, I don't drink as much other craft beer as I used to, you know, and, I, and in a way that kind of sounds like, you know, very narcissistic and small-minded, but your schedule gets so busy, you know, and, um, you know, people always joke about, oh, you get to drink free beer. And I'm like, no, it's not free. This is like million dollar beer. Because <laughs> it takes a lot of money to operate a brewery of, you know, of our size. And, you know, every little pipe, every stainless steel pipe costs, you know, $200. And, you know, a new fermenter is, you know, several tens of thousands of dollars. And so it's... um understand you know what you're getting into and you know i think i see a lot of a lot of people like looking at uh, opening businesses and make sure you understand what model you're trying to open your business under are you an on-premise is your equipment sized properly or you know is your and do you have the right location to facilitate that or are you going to be a production facility that's you know shipping out your beer are you right size for that do you have enough cooperage you know, are you going with a distributor? You know, do you have a sales structure? You know, we've seen a couple of breweries change ownership because they didn't have perhaps the right sales force. They went to a distributorship in effort to solve getting beer out of, you know, out of their door. But then ultimately that relationship didn't prove, you know, to be the best thing for them and it hurt them a lot financially. So just understand your business model and make sure that you have done your research and you have a really solid plan. Yeah. And to, to put your forward thinking hat on again, where do you see the industry going? I mean, again, we can look back and there have been massive changes over the last five or six years, but where, where do you envision it going over the next five so, or six? So, you know, I think you're gonna continue to see that this trend of hyper-local um, and on-premise. You know, people in general are always looking for an experience. So, you know, what what experience does your tap room provide provide for them? Um, community orientation is really important. You know, are you a member of the community? Um, do people, you know, can people identify with your your brand? Um, so, I think you know, the, continuing to focus on on premise, whether that also means having food on premise or maybe a combination of food on premise and occasional food truck 
um, which is what we're kind of looking, you know, but casual like walk-up dining type service where you order and then it's brought to your table, not just, you know, full table side service. Um, but we're looking at partnering with somebody for that because restauranting is not in my core competency. And I know now, you know, that's just not something that I would remotely get involved in. Um, but uh, I think that's part of where it's going. And I really think that whole uh, regional brewery uh, model is going to become more difficult to get into and to sustain. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot of changes with some big breweries that maybe were out in the West Coast and expanded to the East Coast and now have pulled back, um, you know, or closed up shop and just it wasn't working and I, I think you know we see that trend in general um, you see the distributors perhaps ink, and, ink a deal with somebody from another location and you see all kinds of promotional effort um, focused on you know bringing that beer to market and then three months later the distributor has another new brewery that they're working with and your you know your focus is kind of going by the wayside and as I said, that's one of the reasons that we haven't really looked too much at a distributorship model for being um, our primary way of, of selling our back of house beer, because we just don't feel that we can get the sales representation um, in the way, shape, and form that we like, and the cost of having them just handle logistics doesn't make sense for us. Yeah. So. What would you say is your favorite part of working in the North Carolina beer industry? There's a, there's not a typical day. I don't know if you guys heard that. Yeah, I was gonna say, that was a scary. <laughs> that was a scary sound. You were talking about how much the pipes cost, and then you heard cry. <laughs> yeah, but I, actually, I think what is just a fitting. They're doing some cleaning in the brewery right now. Ah. Um, we do monthly. We wipe down our tanks and everything. And I think there was just a fitting that they had taken off that may have tumbled onto the ground. Stainless is pretty tough. That's it's a not good a, thing. Not as scary as. as <laughs> in a sight glass. No. <laughs> no. Um, so what would you say is your favorite part about working in the North Carolina craft beer industry? Um, the cooperation. I used that word uh, you know, a little earlier. So um, here in Holly Springs, we have another brewery, uh, Carolina Brewing. Those guys, you know, paved the way starting back in, I think it was 1996. Um, but, you know, if we have something that we're running into that's unfamiliar here, um, you know, we have each other's numbers. We text each other like, hey, can you come by? Or, hey, you know, I thought we had, you know, 55 pounds of this, but we don't. And can I run over and buy, you know, and we're, we're like that. You know, we go to their tap room and drink and they come to our tap room and, and drink. And, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Or, just that friendly exchange. We had, um, you know, a meeting up at Linwood last week, just talking to Ted and, you know, his staff with, you know, they're building out a restaurant, just talking about some of the challenges. So people are always open to, you know, helping you grow and, you know, talking about, you know, how can we help each other, but yet still be, have friendly competition. It's kind of like sibling rivalry. I like that. <laughs> so now we're going to move on to the couple of fun questions to end. What's your favorite bombshell beer? Ooh, great question. Um, so I get asked that all the time. And one of my responses, it's like my children. I love them all equally. But on some days I like some more than others. So right now I'm, I'm digging on our Citra Pale Ale with mango. Um, we just ran out of our bourbon barrel aged uh, Dirty Secret Coconut Stout. Um, in, I love a lot of dark beers, but probably my go-to beer right now that I, you know, like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of like craving this beer is Our Lady in Red. Um, and that's one of Devin's, you know, mastermind uh, beer recipes. Um, he trained uh, at Red Oak Brewing um, early on and he, re he, he has German background to him. Um, from a family standpoint. So he really loves to do more German style lagers. Um, and uh, Lady in Red, it's an, it's an ale, um, but uh, you know, it, it leans in, in towards you know, a lot of that lager style and it's really a tasty beer. And he's won a couple medals with it. So it's, it's a good go-to. Yeah. 
So, and you mentioned you don't get a chance to enjoy <laughs> beer from other places very often, but do you have a favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? Well, I have a lot because, you know, and, that, and that's the thing. I mean, there's so much beer out there, it's hard to, you know, to drink it all. Um, one that I really like a lot lately is uh, Like Mike that Carolina Brewing just did um, for their anniversary, and it's a New England style IPA, and of course, I, you know, everybody knows here at the brewery, I, I love New England style IPAs, um, and I, I really mean that. I'm probably the one that likes them the most here, and I, 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 we, can, we could never produce enough of them, but, um, it's not, but it's not everybody else's favorite style. But um, I really enjoyed that a lot, um, and you know, uh, I was, when I was up at Linwood last week, they had a really nice Berliner Weiss that was, was pretty cool. Yeah. So. So you probably don't have much in the way of free time anymore, <laughs> but when, when you're not here at work, uh, what do you enjoy doing in your free time? So I still like to golf um, occasionally. Um, you know, that's always fun. You know, I have a family. My, my kids are in college, but they're home for the summer. So, um, and sadly, this is probably going to be like the last summer that, you know, they stay at home because they've moved into apartments that are more year-round oriented and some want to travel abroad for studies next year. So um, just trying to focus more on the family and my parents are getting older so you know trying to see them more often and they live out of state and um, my fiance's mother lives out of state so you know that going in those directions and unfortunately there our parents are in an age where they can travel too we have to go to them so right yeah <laughs> it's all good yeah well that pretty much wraps up the list of prepared questions I had is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to make sure that we get in terms of the whole story well you know I think you know just maybe kind of you know, what's next for Bombshell? I think my ultimate dream for the company would to become an employee-owned corporation um, or, you know, a B corporation at some point. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if I won the lottery this weekend, you know, that might be something that I try to make happen. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very uh, interesting, uh, and there aren't a lot of breweries, I don't think, that kind of have that set up, are there? There's, um, I, there might be a few that are out of state. I think New Belgium maybe a set up like that as well. Employee the owned, yeah. yeah. Um, but as far as B corporations, I think there's been one or two that have kind of set up initially with that, that mindset, Interesting. so. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Much. We really appreciate it.